of Worship, your source for commentary and discussion on worship, theology, and culture. I'm your host, Dr. Jonathan Michael Jones. Hello and welcome to the Act of Worship podcast. This is Dr. Jonathan Michael Jones. Great to be with you here today, continuing the Psalm Project, which will take some time. So be patient. I'm trying to do two a week, and I've succeeded at doing that so far. But that is not to say that uh, there could be weeks where I don't get to two a week, or even one a week. We'll see. But right now, I'm um, I've been faithful in doing that. So I will continue to try to do that. And today, we are going to be looking at Psalm chapter 11, Psalm 11, the 11th Psalm. Um, a psalm of David, as basically all of these have been so far. David wrote about half of the psalms, uh, so not all of the psalms were written by David, but this is one that was written by David. And um, uh, Psalm 11 and Psalm 12 have made great musical settings. Um, I almost set Psalm 11 in a um, in a minor key. I decided not to, and I decided to make it uh, a little bit faster um, in tempo, but uh, it would be a good psalm to set in a minor key, perhaps, because of its theme and its um, its content. This is another psalm of refuge. We've already looked at some of these psalms of refuge. Um, David here is threatened by his enemies. And so he puts his confidence in God. And so without any further ado, let's read. It's a very short psalm. Let's read it, and then uh, we'll break it down. And uh, Psalm 11 and 12, and perhaps even 13 and 14, I'm, I'm looking at those. They're very short. 15 is short as well. Um, the content, my commentary may not take that long on some of these, so you may just... You may not have to endure me talking very much on these psalms. We'll see, but... Uh, uh, I don't think, certainly Psalm 12, you probably won't have to endure my um, my annoying talking if you don't like that, but you'll, you'll be able to hear the psalm at least. Um, so let me read Psalm 11. In the Lord I take refuge. How can you say to my soul, flee like a bird to your mountain? For behold, the wicked bend the bow. They have fitted their arrow to the string to shoot in the dark at the upright in heart. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes see, his eyelids test the children of man. The Lord tests the righteous, but his soul hates the wicked and the one who loves violence. Let him rain coals on the wicked, fire and sulfur, and a scorching wind shall be the portion of their cup. For the Lord is righteous. He loves righteous deeds. The upright shall behold his face. So let's break this down. A psalm of refuge. David is seeking uh, shelter from his enemies. And right there at the very beginning, (laughs) he admits and confesses, In the Lord, I take refuge. Uh, And then he says, he's speaking, obviously, it's rhetorical, but he says, how can you say to my soul, flee like a bird to your mountain? Uh, This possibly could be, as I mentioned um, last week, uh, think about Hebrew translators here and the difficulty that they have. This could possibly be from your mountain, and in fact, there are some Bible versions that will translate it as from your mountain rather than to your mountain. If it's if it is to your mountain, then the advice is to flee the city for a mountain fortress. If it is from your mountain, the reference here is to Zion. In either case, David is being advised by others to find salvation or to find uh, help elsewhere other than God. And you think about Job's friends, that's kind of what they did to him. <laughs> Reject God, abandon him. In verse 2, the wicked bend the bow, and they fitted their arrow. 
While, th- while this psalm may have had an original military setting and, and would find an appropriate use during periods of war, the image could also refer to other types of affliction. So this could be uh, very much a metaphor. In verse 3, if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? The foundations, that is, of the, con- of the kingdom conceived as a political entity, including its economy, its military, and the like. And so that's what David's referring to here. He says, what can the righteous do? Or in some translations, it could be, um, for the foundations will be destroyed. What has the righteous done? So sort of a past tense. When he's talking about the righteous, and you might think that, that David here is talking about righteous people, uh, but it's perhaps a reference to God, and that's the direction I lean. I think it is a reference to God, the righteous one. And the next few verses, the reason I think that is because the next few verses go on to describe what God is doing. And so it's sort of a rhetorical question here, what can the righteous do? And so while it may seem that David is referring to righteous people or God's people, I think it's referring to God. Well, here's what he can do. And then he goes on to describe that. He says, the Lord's throne is in heaven in verse four. As the king of the universe, God is in control and nothing escapes his notice. (laughs) I'm amazed that sometimes we think we can get away with sin and maybe God didn't see that. No, God sees everything. He knows everything. And that's not just a cute little thing we tell kids. It's the truth. We should always be aware of that. And so not even the actions of of the wicked are beyond the purview of God. And then verse 6 a very graphic image here. Let him rain coals on the wicked, fire and sulfur and a scorching wind. This is reminiscent of the judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis chapter 19. Certainly David would have known about this. Evil will be completely burned up. And he says that these things, these these terrible things he mentions, shall be the portion of of their cup. There is a cup of God's blessing. We see that in the 23rd Psalm, my cup runneth over. But there is also a cup of his wrath. Every person has a cup. You receive the cup of God's blessing or the cup of God's wrath. The wicked will drink wrath to its dregs. I want to read you uh, something from Psalm chapter 75, uh, 75 verse 8. For in the hand of the Lord there is a cup with foaming wine, well mixed, and he pours out from it. And all the wicked of the earth shall drain it down to the dregs. So the wicked will drink the wrath, the cup of the wrath of God, while the righteous, or the people of God who honor him, will drink the cup of his blessing. Jesus Christ took his people's punishment upon himself, by drinking the cup of God's judgment. If you remember in the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus was praying and he said, if it is possible, take this cup from me. And so he took on the cup of God's wrath, which was designed or or intended, well, not intended, but uh, uh, which should have been placed on humanity. And Jesus Christ took it himself for God's people. And then in verse 7, for the Lord is righteous. The Lord loves righteous deeds. The upright shall behold his face. His face, God, will make his presence known to his people in the darkness. And in the resurrection of the just, this hope will be realized. And so a lot of times when scripture talks about the face of God or the countenance of God, it's linked to light. Uh, For example, in the Aaronic benediction, Aaron says, may the Lord's face shine upon us. And so sometimes God's face is linked to light. And here uh, is a similar case. God will make his presence known to his people in the darkness. And David here is in a dark time, obviously, and, and seeking refuge. 
And then says, the upright shall behold his face. So even in the darkness, even in times of darkness, the people of God will know his presence. His countenance will shine upon them. So uh, this is Psalm 11, and uh, made a great musical setting. Um, You know, I try to be as different as possible. I don't want all of the Psalms to sound exactly the same. Uh, Sometimes they will, and and especially... uh, as a composer, often composers have isms that they use. And so you could say Jonathan isms if you want. Uh, Mozart had his Mozart isms or their Beethoven isms that Beethoven used. You know, certain te- uh, nuances in their music that were very much uh, linked to them as a composer. When you hear that, that, that device that that person used, you know, well, that is. Um, uh, in, indicative of that particular composer. And so there are nuances in my music that might sound like me, where you hear it and go, oh, yep, yeah, that's Jonathan. <laughs> uh, so uh, these next few psalms, Psalm 11 and Psalm 12, uh, might include some of that, but hopefully this is a tool that allows your heart to worship in this uh, psalm of refuge, Psalm 11. So thank you for listening today to the Act of Worship podcast. This is Dr. Jonathan Michael Jones. My trust is in the Lord. How can you say? Like a bird escape into your mountain flee The wicked bend the bow with arrow fixed for flight To shoot it at the righteous one in cover of the night What can the righteous do if the foundations fall? The Lord is in his holy place, the Lord rules over all his eyes will surely see His eyelids tears when sons The Lord tries just and wicked men His soul hates cruel ones Upon all wicked men He'll rain in tangling snares Brimstone and fire and burning wind He for their cup prepares For righteous is the Lord Loves righteous ways.